Thank you. The final item of business is a member's business debate on motion 15541 in the name of Bob Doris on efforts to save St Rollock's Railway Works. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Can I ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now? And I call on Bob Doris to open the debate. Mr Doris, please. Presiding officer, it's a privilege to lead this member's debate on the future of railway operations at the historic St Rollock site in my constituency, a site that's been a global player in the world locomotive industry since 1856. Importantly, we still have 200 jobs at the site, 120 directly employed and 80 agency workers. It is those jobs that are now under imminent threat. New owners, Gemini, prematurely issued workers with a statutory 45-day consultation notice in January this year. That is a prelude to redundancies and closure. There is an order book until June this year, and therefore such notices would not have been required, if at all, until April this year. That would have afforded precious time to work together to find solutions. I want to thank the many MSPs from right across the chamber who have signed my motion. I also want to thank Unite the Union for the determined and challenging campaign to save both jobs and the railway's future in Springburn. Presiding officer, it is the job of unions to offer challenge and to defend their members, and I commend them in doing so. Many of us have decided to rally around the Cali, as St Rollocks is affectionately known, including Glasgow's Evening Times newspaper, who are also championing the campaign. I warmly welcome their support. Now, this is the second of two debates in the matter, and I thank all of those who contributed to yesterday's debate. In that debate, I reflected the anger and disillusionment that the workforce have with Gemini as well as the compelling reasons why many of us feel they have not acted in good faith. Briefly, yes. Yeah. Elaine Smith. Thanks very much, um, President Officer. I thank Bob Doris for taking the inter intervention. I'm a member of Unite the Union, but I think uh, it would be good to also recognise that the RMT have um, staff at, at the facility and have an interest as well. I'm sure Bob Doris would want to join me in doing that. Bob Doris. I, I associate myself with all of those remarks, and that is now on the record. I thank Ms Smith for, 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 for that intervention. Anger and disillusionment are absolutely justified, but such emotions alone do not save jobs. It can, however, drive innovation, new ideas, necessitate robust business planning and subsequent strategic action. Our public sector and partnership with the rail industry can secure both jobs and a long-term future for St Rollocks. I spoke yesterday about a pipeline of work available for railway engineering, repair and maintenance. However, the complex and quite frankly ludicrous system by which rolling stock is owned, leased, tendered and funded across the UK does not serve as well. I understand Gemini have bid for all possible work, yet they have indicated they would be likely to close Springburn even if all potential work was secured. I describe that as a dereliction of duty. Cabinet Secretary, I would request details of whether Scottish Enterprise have discussed the pipeline of work with Gemini in any detail and sought to explore how that work could be viably procured and carried out at St Rollocks. What work has taken place regarding how many workers would be required for each contract, the skills mix needed and the length of time each contract would run for. This would require a full understanding of overheads, not just for materials, wages and site rent, but also how appropriate it is for to apportion central costs from their Milton Keynes HQ on top of those overheads. That included an eye-watering £1.16 million for 2018. Such a detailed and costly business plan would be important not only for Gemini to keep a presence at St Rollocks, but also for any other company to seek to carry out any operations at the site alternatively. Is such a pipeline of work projected over several years captured in any one document and is that publicly available? Any strategic approach to the Scottish railway sector must have a systematic look at the likely pipeline of work over the longer term. It must also look at capacity in the Scottish sector. Given that I understand 60% of that capacity is at St Rollocks, the loss of the site would be a strategic blow to our economic infrastructure, inter infrastructure interests. We know that Unite have made some specific proposals and I hope the Cabinet Secretary can update us this evening as to his most recent engagement with the Union and to discuss these proposals with us. I have no idea if the 2p transfer suggested is feasible, if a workers buyout is a realistic prospect, nor do I know the shape or timescale around the strategic railway hub at St Rollocks that has been suggested. But if these are achievable, we must try and we must try in some detail to secure these. A key question, though, is if Gemini is not bidding for work to be done at St Rollocks, then who will bid for some work, for that work? 
and how can that be facilitated? For instance, have Unite asked for support to develop a business plan from Scottish Enterprise to facilitate a workers' buyout? Or have third parties been actively approached by the Scottish Government and encouraged to bid for work that can be carried out at St Rollocks? I would welcome an update. Let me refer to one contract in particular. I understand Gemini have bid for the refurbishment of 33 170 class trains from both ScotRail and Northern Rail. You might speculate that work could keep around 40 skilled workers employed at St Rollocks for up to three years. That would retain a foothold at St Rollocks for a meaty period of time to allow the possibility of a railway hub to be explored. However, there is concern Gemini will win that work and carry it out at Wolverton in England. I would urge Gemini and their parent company, Mataris, to ensure that should such work be successfully procured, that it is carried out at St Rollocks. Mataris cannot stay silent, and I hope they can be a key player in helping reset the relationship between Gemini, workers, unions, and other stakeholders. Gemini may be painting themselves into a corner, and perhaps Mataris can assist in finding a solution. Yesterday, I claimed Gemini were inflexible, unimaginative, unambitious, and lacking in goodwill. I asked them to prove me wrong. It would appear they now have that opportunity. I hope we can reset the relationship with Gemini, presiding officer. I've sought to do my bit by helping to establish a stakeholder group, which will meet for a third time tomorrow. I've helped to try to reduce the cost base in relation to the lease. I've sought to seek to reduce overheads and increase the range of work that can be carried out at the site by pushing for electrification. And I've urged that every possible delivery model to save jobs is explored. Yesterday, I mentioned that companies expand the contract depending on their order book and projected future business. Perhaps a railway hub fully under public sector control and with several companies operating at St Rollocks may emerge in the future. However, the future that workers are imminently concerned about is twofold. It is their jobs and it's the continuation of railway works at St Rollocks. No matter what happens with Gemini, we must ensure that railway works continue to operate at St Rollocks. We must also maximise the opportunity for as many workers as possible to retain their skilled employment in Springburn. Anyone who does not must have the utmost support to secure skilled employment within the West of Scotland. But crucially, Cabinet Secretary, in closing, this must be a turning point for the railway industry in Springburn and for Scotland. Let's secure the long-term future of St Rollocks and its expansion in the years ahead. Because, presiding officer, these are difficult and distressing times for the workers and their families. And we owe it to them to make that vision a reality. Thank you very much, Mr Doris. I call Fulton McGregor to be followed by Jamie Green. Mr McGregor, please. Thank you. Um, sorry. Thank you, presiding officer. Um, and I want to start off by thanking Bob Doris for bringing this debate to the Chamber and, of course, for his work uh, and passion on this issue, which has been there for everybody to see. And uh, like others, I'm sure we'll do mention yesterday's debate, which I uh, brought forward by James Kelly, which I, I sat in for the, the vast majority of. And I think that demonstrates the importance of this uh, particular issue. There are a few reasons, presiding officer, why I've chosen to speak uh, tonight, not least because of constituents in Cope Bridge and my constituency who work there. And I'd like to put on record and mention Neil Patterson, uh, who, who contacted me directly, uh, as did others. And I want to thank him for contacting me and letting me know uh, about what the, the potential devastation, uh, devastating impact would be for him and his family should the works close. And I think that, that Bob Doris ended on that note. And, and that gentleman is one person who's contacted me uh, to let me know exactly how that would impact on him and other workers in my constituency. And it was a good demonstration yesterday uh, outside the parliament, and I thank the unions uh, and others who organised that, and, um, and that is why I went out to, to attend a, a demonstration with, with Bob Doris um, uh, and others. But I also think this is an issue that will impact uh, all of Scotland, presiding officer, and I think that Alex Neil uh, summed this up uh, well in his, his speech yesterday. Uh, it's tied to an industrial past, and perhaps in that way, there's solidarity between the Glasgow, Lanarkshire and other areas who have this uh, rich heritage. These communities, as people know, are intertwined and have a shared history and culture. And like others yesterday in the chamber, uh, James Kelly's uh, moving speech amongst others, I've, I've often stood in here and talked uh, with pride of my, of my grandfather, his involvement in the heavy industries in Cope Bridge and Lanarkshire as a whole. And I know that if he'd still been here today, he'd be fully behind the workers at St Rollocks absolutely no doubt about it and of course um, in my own constituency again there's the, the freight liner 
uh, the uh, industry, the business, which I know that the Cabinet Secretary is visiting sh uh, soon, and I'm sure that he'll have a, a very good experience when I visited it. It was, uh, it was very enlightening, and I know that they will also uh, have full solidarity with the workforce at St Rollox um, in a similar uh, line of work. I've listened to what, what Bob Doris has said uh, quite carefully in his uh, remarks, President Officer, and I, I probably come more than maybe necessarily knowing the ins and outs of the, the business model and what's happened there um, in, in a more constituency basis. I come more from standing up for my constituents who have contacted me and the Scottish industry, uh, uh, you, you know, side of things. But it is clear that this company has not treated its workers fairly at all. And there may be many different solutions. Some have been bandied about. I'm not entirely sure what the best option would be, but I think that we're all agreed that every attempt should be made to save the workforce. And I'll be joining uh, the, the voices calling for, for Gemini, particularly, to do the right thing, uh, engage with the, the, the stakeholders group that, that Bob Doris uh, and others have set up and, uh, and treat their workers uh, fairly. Um, I think this is a, a, a massive moment for the rail industry in Scotland. It's a massive moment for the rail industry in the UK. It's a massive moment for an industrial heritage and industrial past. And I know that um, although the operation itself is based in Glasgow, this has touched the hearts and minds of people across the country. And I can say that it definitely has touched people in Coat Bridge. Uh, and I think that we're all united in calling on the company to do the right thing and stand by its workers. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you very much. I call Jamie Green to be followed by Alec Neil. Mr Green, please. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, can I thank uh, Bob Doris for bringing his motion to the Chamber? I'm uh, very pleased to be able to participate in this. It's not uh, in my region, uh, but this uh, subject matter is very close to my heart, and I've taken great interest in this as I meet stakeholders in the rail industry uh, over the uh, previous months. I think it's also fair to say that uh, we should congratulate the work of uh, both the union mentioned in the motion, but as others have mentioned, uh, others who are standing up for their workforce in this matter, uh, it's clear that there have been um, some serious uh, communication uh, problems with how this has been dealt with. But uh, I did follow yesterday's debate. Um, apologies, I was not participating in it, but I listened to some of the speeches and I think some of the comments made by my colleague Annie Wells as she stood at this site uh, around the significant emotional attachment that many people in the Glasgow area have with the site. Uh, we heard stories of members of families, friends, neighbours, colleagues uh, who've worked at the site and been part of what has been really uh, a stronghold of Scotland's rail industry for decades now, at one point producing 60% of our locomotive engines. You cannot deny that the Springburn site is a hugely strategically important part of the Scottish rail industry and should remain so. Uh, I listened with great interest to some of the discussions around the reasons for why uh, the site uh, it does not have a future in terms of the types of contracts that it's getting. Now, we've heard that we're at a, a step change moment in the Scottish rail industry, and I think that is true. I think there are many positives coming through. There's no doubt that as we change technology, as new carriages are introduced into the network, it, it's, it's no uh, secret that there are over 150 new electric uh, carriages coming into the Scottish rail network uh, in the coming year. Uh, from a number of providers and they will service on local, regional and cross-border services. But with that has come uh, the electrification issue and the fact that a site that is not properly and adequately connected to the electric network will always suffer from a downturn in heavy maintenance in the diesel market. Now this is a, a UK-wide, indeed a European-wide downturn in heavy maintenance of the, the diesel locomotive market. But what has, been, what has struck me is how other sites have been able to deal with this and how to react to this. If you look, for example, at the light maintenance site at Craig and Tinney, now they've had to invest significantly in the infrastructure there to accept different types of locomotives, uh, to upgrade and upscale their workers, to future-proof those skills so that they can deal with new and emerging technologies. But as we start to see things like hydrogen and battery-operated carriages coming online to the network, uh, I hope, uh, we will also see changes in how we get these carriages onto these sites. They no longer should be able to have to be taken off of electric networks and taken by road, which is unprofitable and difficult and cumbersome. And it will be inevitably is the reason why many operators are not giving their business to the site. Uh, I want to touch too much on the politics of all this. I think a lot has been and will be said on what, how this has been handled. But what I would ask the Transport Secretary to think about what conversations ScotRail has had with the owners, its current owners, on, on its potential use of the site. 
I do think there's a general wider question around capacity on the network. Uh, where will this uh, maintenance work be done? Now, we, there are competitors who are well equipped to take on board some of this work, but they themselves will have capacity issues. Are they willing to take on some of the, wo the workforce there? Uh, so what are the opportunities there uh, for some of that work? And Mr. Dorsch raised some fair points about other uses for the site. Will it require any form of intervention? Is there the possibility of any form of intervention? What about the owners of the site? I do believe it's a leasehold site, for example. So is there an appetite there amongst those who own the site to even work with government? And it's inevitable that any form of contract that's given around uh, some of the intercity diesel refurb or HST work that's contracts that are coming up, it is also my view, and I share the view, that any of those uh, Scott Rail contracts, that that work should stay in, in Scotland. I appreciate we're very short in time this evening, and a lot has already been said in the matter. Um, I do think it's very saddening that we are at this stage. I think it could have been possible to see this coming. The industry has been changing for a very long time, and it's unfortunate that we've ended up where we are. I'd like to think that the government and its agencies is working not just with its current owner, but all other potential owners and users of that site to do everything they can to ensure that that workforce there still has work for many years and decades to come. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Green. I call Alec Neil to be followed by James Kelly. Mr. Neil, please. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I just repeat what I said last night? Congratulations to Bob Doris for securing this debate tonight and to James Kelly for securing the debate last night. And I think the message coming out of last night and the message of coming out tonight is that we are united across the chamber uh, in our determination to try to save not just the jobs, but the operations at St. Rolex, if we possibly can. Uh, I, I want to, since I spoke last night, concentrate tonight on the practicalities of what we might be able to do in order to achieve the objective of saving the jobs at St. Rolex and the operation. And I think there are two crucial issues here. The first one is the need to secure breathing space to get Gemini to extend the deadline so that they don't pull out uh, in the next two or three months, but extend the deadline and ideally at least, at the very least, till the end of the calendar year to give us time to find a way forward that can secure the future operation of St. Rolex. It's going to be, well, in a minute, it's going to be extremely difficult to do that in the next few weeks if we don't have the breathing space we need to put certain things in place in order to achieve our objective. Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Officer. I thank the member for giving way. Um, I wouldn't disagree with that, what the member has been saying, but would he agree that as part of that, the, the government could look at a public ownership model? I'm just, Alec I'm just coming to that very issue. So that's the first issue, is to buy the time we need. And can I say to the Minister and to the Scottish Government uh, that we should be using our influence and leverage over the procurement of rolling stock to indirectly to put pressure on the Geminis of this world to uh, live up to their expecta the, our expectations of them in Scotland. I don't see why we should continue to fund an operation where companies treat us with contempt and yet there is no price to pay uh, by those companies for doing so. But the second and more important issue is then what options do we look at? Now, as I said last night, the transport hub option is definitely worth looking at in detail. But there is a second model. And if I can draw attention to two companies which are actually uh, one owned and one planned to be owned by the Scottish Government, we have, unknown to many people in the National Health Service, a commercial subsidiary wholly owned by the National Health Service in Scotland. And its purpose in life is to commercialise the research and development that takes place in our great National Health Service in Scotland. Although it's a small company, in principle, it is the kind of model that can be used to try to see if we can save St. Rolex for the longer term. The government's planning its own national energy company. And again, that's a model that might be applicable here. So what I'm suggesting is, as well as looking at the transport hub and any other ideas, we also look at the idea of creating a company dedicated to St. Rolex, not just to produce for the Scottish market, 
but to produce for the wider market in future. Let's see if we can put that together with investors from elsewhere in the public sector, Scottish enterprise, Scottish government being two examples, bringing in where necessary, if we can, private investment, bringing in the workers for part ownership, bringing in the unions for part ownership, and create a company that's well capitalized to be able to take over the St. Rolex work and turn it into a long-term viable business, not just to safeguard the jobs that are there, but to look towards expansion in the future uh, so that we can take full advantage of the work that will be coming downstream in years to come. Now, that requires a lot of detailed work to establish can it be done? Is it viable? Is it financially viable? If so, what do we need to do to make it happen? But I believe that's a model led by the public sector uh, which can work if we do our homework on it. But we need time to do the homework. We need time to put the business plan together. We need time to raise the equity. We need time to prepare and make sure that we can make this happen and make it a viable proposition, which is why the prerequisite is buying the time now from Gemini, which they owe these workers at St. Rolex and owe Scotland. And if we can do that, we can turn this into a phoenix rising from the ashes. Thank you. I'm, I'm being quite lenient with time because I've not got so many speakers, so you know, I'm quite content if you take extra minute or so, Mr. Kelly, I'm not bothered. I call James Kelly to be followed by uh, Patrick Harvey. Mr. Kelly, please. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, can I start off by congratulating Bob Doris on securing this debate tonight uh, and also complimenting him, complimenting him on the work that he's done in support of the workforce at St. Rolox. Can I also again place on record my uh, thanks to Unite the Union and also RMT for the successful campaign that they have run. I think the, the strength of feeling and emotion that you saw from the workers that were here last night and that were, that were around the parliament is a testimony, testimony to the strength of those trade unions and also how important this issue is uh, in those local communities. We've heard a lot in the, the various speeches that have been made over the, the couple of nights about the case for retaining the plant uh, at the Cali, uh, the strong history and the traditions there going back to 1856, the many families who uh, work at the site up to, right up until the current day. Crucially, the skills that are there, that skilled workforce among the 200 people that are, that are employed there. Uh, and also, I think some crucial points have been made about the rail industry in Scotland and how that has a really strong future and it would, be, it would make no sense at all to see this uh, plant closed when we need a, uh, a, an industry there that provides efficient and smooth running rolling stock. Um, I think the, the other point I'd make is that this is, this is obviously the second debate that's taking place, but I think it allows us to press home some pertinent points uh, that maybe weren't uh, fully, uh, you know, fully in the fully in the parliamentary chamber last night. The, the issue I'd like to raise directly with mm -hmm. the minister is the contract in relation to ScotRail Class 170s. Uh, it's been put to me that this contract has been set up to be awarded to to Wolverton, uh, and if that is the case, it is wholly unacceptable. This is a, an £8 million contract uh, involving uh, 33 trains, which would start in December 2019, run for a three-year period, and secure at least 40 of the jobs. Uh, the bulk of the work relates to ScotRail. So it strikes me that uh, if there is... Alec Neil made the point, in terms of procurement, if work... Uh, has been, has been bid for that relates to Scott Rail trains. That should be carried out in Scotland at the Cali site. Uh, it shouldn't be getting passed down to, to Wolverton. And that's a matter of deep concern. And I would ask the Minister to clarify the precise position with that contract. Uh, and I would say that the government have got to ensure 
that that contract remains at the St. Rolock site. It shouldn't be getting set up to, to Wolverton. Yes, sure. Bob Doris. I thank the member for giving way. I, I have a question to ask, but I should put on my record my thanks to James Kelly for yesterday's debate, which I, I, I was remiss of me not to do that, so let, so let me do that now. But you make an important point about the 170 work. But also they'll be working six months, one year, two years, three years. There seems a guddle in terms of what that pipeline of work looks like. Do you think there's much more openness and transparency across the railway sector of what work is likely to emerge to allow for forward planning within industry more generally, but St Rollocks in particular? James Kelly. I think the, the, the point, the valid point that Bob Doris makes is that the, there is a pipeline of work there um, and we've got a skilled workforce uh, at this site. So it's absolutely paramount that the government, and there's broad agreement, I think, across all the parties, ensures that come March the 4th, when this consultation ends, uh, we don't see the, the site beginning to close down. You know, we need to keep it open. And that sort of brings me to my final point that uh, Bob Doris said that motions on their own do not save jobs, and that's correct. And I think what's needed now is not motions or warm words, but specific action from the government to ensure that come March the 4th, uh, we've still got the time, as Alec Neil said, to develop the models and ensure that the work is in place going forward. From that point of view, the government needs to look at the issue of not just intervention, but public ownership. Uh, if not on a permanent basis, at least on a temporary basis from March the 4th, that would allow the work to take place to assess the viability of the transport hub, to look at how we take forward the issue of electrification, which uh, would, would save ultimately save a lot of costs and make bidding for contracts more viable in the longer term and also look at how we can ensure that we get contracts in place. So I think it's absolutely crucial that the Minister gives these assurances in his summing up speech but I reiterate the point that if there are if there's Scott Rail work um, being awarded in, in contracts then that must be we must intervene to assure immediately that that is being allocated to the St Rolox site and not the Wolverton site. Thank you very much. And I call Patrick Harvey to be followed by Bill Kidd. Mr Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I add my thanks to Bob Doris for bringing this evening's debate and to James Kelly for bringing yesterday's debate. I, uh, I signed both motions, but I, I sadly wasn't able to stay uh, last night for James Kelly's debate, and I'm pleased that I'm able to, to stay for this one. The unions also, as others have said, should have all of our thanks and support for the work that they're doing, obviously to respond to the immediate threat to something in the region of 200 highly skilled jobs which are at threat. We need to do whatever we can to prevent that threat from becoming a reality and not only to, to campaign uh, against the, the planned closures uh, but to find opportunities for that site to go forward with a, a stronger future ahead of it. But I think this, this debate also forces us to confront some deeper issues about the nature of ownership in our modern economy and the, the role of the private sector. Very few of us would suggest that the private sector should have no role at all in a modern economy. But too often, too often at the moment, private ownership comes with rights and not responsibilities. And we don't expect enough in terms of the commitment that owners need to show to the communities that they are engaged with. That applies whether we're talking about land ownership, about housing, about other buildings, and certainly ownership of companies as well. And the fact, as was remarked in yesterday's debate, that we can be in a situation where a company that's owned this asset for you know, not much more than five minutes can then make a decision, not even to recognise it as an asset that's of importance to the community and to the economy, but merely as a, a part of its economic portfolio and decide to dispose of it in this, in this way. And to announce that in the run-up to Christmas as well was, uh, showed, I think, nothing short of contempt for the community affected. We do need to challenge this notion uh, that private ownership confers absolute rights 
and not the responsibilities to invest in and to protect the people who are affected by the decisions that owners make. And we should also recognise some of the positive advantages that can come from public ownership, particularly in a situation like this where there is not uh, a, a simple uh, continuous throughput of work. We should all be pleased that there are fewer very old carriages running around on Scotland's railways. We should be pleased, and I think most of us are, that we're seeing upgrades and a new rolling stock in place. But if that means a, a change to the, the amount of refurbishment work that's going to happen, it's not forever, because new rolling stock doesn't stay new forever. So there will continue to be a need for the capacity to do the maintenance work that's required. So this site has the skills and needs the infrastructure to be able to access the work that will be needed in future to continue to refurbish not only Scotland's rolling stock, uh, but those in other areas as well. And having travelled on a northern train uh, just in the last week or so, I can confirm there's some refurbishment work needed there as well. Uh, I'll give way. Jamie Green. Uh, I thank Mr Harvey for giving way. And it is on this point of uh, continuous work on rolling stock. Uh, given that, however, uh, there are two other businesses that operate in the same space as the site in Springburn, what effect would public intervention in terms of ownership of that business have on the other two businesses' ability to also accept contracts if one is publicly owned and the other two are privately owned? And it's a, a genuine question and what he thinks. Patrick Harvey. It, it is a serious question, and I, I'm sure it's the kind of serious question that would have confronted the Scottish Government uh, in looking at taking public ownership of Presswick, where there is another airport on the west coast of Scotland. Uh, there is a potential that a publicly owned airport uh, might change the, the economic context of a privately owned airport. But our, our objective and our priority in making those kind of decisions should not be what's in the best interests of the shareholders who own the privately owned part of the economy. It's what's in the best interests of the whole of our economy uh, and of the people who work in it and the communities that are affected by that work as well. The, the, the last point on, on ownership is, and I, I want to, to reflect on Alex Neal's speech and, and welcome uh, some of the points that he made. It was, it was good that he took this opportunity to remind the Scottish Government that it already does have a, a, a record of seeing opportunities for the role of, of public ownership uh, in the, the economy, in parts of the economy where the private sector is also active. Now, some of us would like that, that role of public ownership to be bigger than it is now, but the Scottish Government does have some record of seeing opportunities for a role for public ownership. So I would encourage the Minister uh, to respond to those points uh, in summing up. Uh, I, reading the report of yesterday's debate, it seemed that the Minister wanted to spend, uh, to, to get more emphasis in the, in the first debate on the wider issues around the rail industry. Uh, I hope, therefore, he'll take the opportunity in closing on this debate to respond specifically to the two uh, objectives in the, in the Unite campaign. Uh, the electrification measures he did uh, reflect on briefly. Can he tell us, uh, you know, what certainty is the, the work that the Scottish Government is undertaking to look into that? What certainty is that giving to the owners? Are they responding to that? Is that going to change their decision? Are there any signals that it will change their decision? And secondly, uh, on the wider point about a public intervention from the Scottish Government, it may be that Presswick, Presswick isn't the ideal model. Maybe there are others, as Alec Neil suggests, but we do need to hear a response from the Scottish Government on that specific proposition uh, in order to know how we're going to move forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. I've got Bill Kidd, followed by Neil Finlay. Mr Finlay is the last speaker in the open debate. Mr Kidd. Yes, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Um, when you come in near the end of a really, really classy, and I have to say that honestly, a really thought-out, intelligent debate, in particular one which stretches across the chamber, uh, you feel as if sometimes as if you, most of what's, what you want to say has already been said but I would like to actually speak here specifically in order to show the weight of support that is here for uh, St Rollocks and the workers there. Um, I'm not just saying because I'm going to bring weight to it, but the numbers I think who speak should, should show that this parliament cares a great deal about this issue. Um, and I'd like to recognise the efforts of Bob Doris, MSP, and Transport Secretary Michael Matheson and others um, to ensure that the voices and hopes of the workers at St Rollocks Railway Works are heard and prioritised at this very difficult time. 
in order to achieve the best possible outcome for the highly skilled and specialised workers at the Cali, there must be good faith shown on all sides. Genuine commitment to honouring the years of high quality efforts the workforce at this site has, um, has shown, and we must maximise the time available to ensure that all viable avenues are assessed and given due consideration. St Rollocks is a historic site, as has been said, and its loss would leave a gaping hole in the community to this day. From 1856, empowering the Industrial Revolution, with 60% of the world's locomotive engines being built at the Cali, it's a significant part of 19th century Scottish industrial history, but it resonates right to this very day with the workforce there. There might be operational changes to be made, but with reports of contracts having been turned away, there must be life left yet. As I said earlier, good face must be shown, and I urge Gemini to accept an independent review of their finances concerning operations at St Rollocks, because independent analysis could lead to new approaches to business plans for the site and business going forward. I believe this is the least a responsible company can do as an employer. I know that the workforce at St Rollocks come not only from the Springburn area, but from across Glasgow and the west of Scotland, including my own Annie's Land area, and that the quality of work which they produced would not be easily replicated anywhere else. Further, it's not only the direct jobs at the Cali, but many others in the surrounding community rely on this being a viable working site. A good and competitive business is built with planning, management and a skilled workforce. And it would be a foolish investor who would put money into a company which doesn't recognise this. And I believe that Gemini should remember this going forward because I'm sure they wouldn't want to be appear to be driven by asset stripping allegations. As I said at the start, the Transport Secretary has played a key role in chairing the working group and I know that the Scottish Government will do its best to secure a viable St Rollocks site and continuing jobs for this valuable workforce and I think that the contributions that have been made here tonight will help in achieving that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Kidd. I call the last speaker, Mr Finlay, please. Thanks, President Officer, and I thank uh, Bob Doris and James Kelly for bringing these debates forward. This uh, uh, site is not in my region, but it's a national asset. It's a national uh, piece of infrastructure. It's very important, and that's why I've got an interest in it. If you think about um, the, the time that this uh, business, this uh, plant's been around, 160 years, I'm sure 160 years ago there was businesses making, say, penny-farthing bikes. And if they sold them, and then that went out of fashion or out of style and they were unable to diversify into new products, then that business would fail. And it would probably deserve to fail if they were unable to keep up with the times. But that's not what's happening here because this is a plant that has kept up with the times. It has been able to produce over all that period of time. So that's, that analogy does not fit with this site. And what the workers need at this time is not warm words. They don't need our sympathy. I'm sure they've had heaps of that from other people. What they need is action. They need action to protect jobs and protect their futures because we can't have hugely important industrial sites passed on time and again and again and again by owners. Eh, owners of companies with little care or regard for those who produce the profits that generate the shareholder dividends, but they have no regard for their well-being. We've seen that with this company that's been passed on over half a dozen uh, times. A profitable company. This is not a lame duck. This is a profitable business. So I have to ask. It's a bit like looking at the East Coast line. A profitable business comes in to public ownership and then what do they do? They want to flog it again to the private sector. If this is a profitable business, what would be the barrier to taking it in to public ownership to then generate profits that would go in to the industry and into the sector or indeed to the wider economy. If it was a lame duck asset, then I would see the point of shirking away from that. But it is not, it is a profitable sector. And this could be the first part of bringing the rail sector and network back into public control. If it's too big a, an apple to bite at once, then let's take a wee bit at a time and this could be the first step in that process and I think that's what we should do. If we look what Scottish Enterprise does, 
It provides grants to businesses time and again. Some of these businesses, in my opinion, are absolute chancers. I look at what happened with Kayam over uh, uh, Christmas in my uh, area. Given money time and again by Scottish Enterprise with very questionable conditions attached to that money and yet they get support and then within a few years they're off leaving 300 workers uh, with no job. This is a business that's been, this is a plant that's been around for 160 years. Surely this deserves that support too. Now we know that our railways are uh, uh, run by uh, the Dutch, but this asset could be taken under our control and run by us as part of that incremental move towards full public ownership of the rail network. And I think that's what we should be doing at a time, particularly at a time when we're supposed to be moving freight and passengers off roads and onto rail with all the implications that has for our health, the environment and the economy. I think if we were to leave this plant to wither on the altar of uh, laissez-faire economics where the market rules over long-term planning and sustainability, that would be absolute madness. So I have to say to the Minister at this point, sympathy, fine. I'm sure we've all got sympathy, but that will uh, cut, not cut through with any of the workers at this plant. What they need is action and very specific action from you, Minister, and I hope tonight you will tell us what that is. Thank you very much, Mr Finlay. And I call on Michael Matheson to close the debate for the Government Cabinet Secretary, please. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy President Officer. And can I, like others, um, offer my congratulations to uh, Bob Doris in securing uh, this debate? As I said last night, uh, Bob Doris is the local constituency MSP. He's been very diligent in pursuing this issue on behalf of, uh, on behalf of his constituents and also uh, the uh, future uh, provision of uh, a rail site at the uh, St Rollock site at the present time. Uh, and I'll certainly continue to work with him in pursuing these matters through the stakeholders group and the ongoing work uh, that's continued to be taken forward by uh, Scottish Enterprise, Transport Scotland and also uh, in partnership with the, the unions. Uh, in last night's debate, uh, Deputy Signing Officer, I uh, highlighted to members the value uh, that this particular sector, the rail industry, has to the Scottish economy. And the very fact that we're going through a period of unprecedented investment in the rail sector in Scotland. And that's why it's particularly disappointing that Gem and I have chosen to, uh, to uh, end uh, their continued involvement at this particular uh, site. Uh, and we as a government are also determined to do what we can in order to build up this sector. It's one which I mentioned last night that I think has often been overlooked and undervalued, and one which the work has now been taken forward by Scottish Enterprise with the sector is behind trying to build that up and to sustain it uh, in moving uh, forward. And uh, attraction of Talgo to the Long Gannett site is a very practical example of the work we're doing to try and build up uh, the rail industry in Scotland. Having said that, though, this is an industry that still has very significant challenges and it has significant challenges for what a number of members have pointed out because of the new rolling stock which is being introduced there are some sites which are largely dependent on undertaking heavy refurbishment heavy rail refurbishment work on what is effectively british rail rolling stock rolling stock that was in the network prior to its privatization and the reality is that the amount of that stock which requires refurbishment is in decline. And this is not just having an impact here in Scotland, it's having an impact right across the UK and actually beyond the UK. And a key part of that is about making sure we do what we can to try and help to ensure that where rolling stock is requiring work to be undertaken, that as much of that as possible is undertaken here in Scotland. But there are specific challenges around being able to achieve that. Bob Doris referred to the complexity of the rolling stock environment within the rail industry, one which places considerable challenges in being able to make sure that that work is undertaken here in Scotland. And Jimmy Green in his uh, contribution highlighted, I think, uh, very, uh, very well the challenges within this sector and the changing nature of this sector. Alongside that, we've got a, a site, the Springburn site, uh, which is over 160 years old, designed at a time when the needs and the demands of the industry were different 
and also designed in a way that does not reflect the needs of and the demands of modern rolling stock and the maintenance and refurbishment of modern rolling stock. stock. And that's why um, one of the things that is extremely important here, and I'll come on to this in more detail around the hub idea, is extremely important. But the reality is that for this site with Gemini at the present time, uh, the work will be finished at the end of uh, July. It's been extended by some additional work, uh, four trains that have been put in there by uh, ScotRail in order to have uh, some heavy engineering work carried out on them. But it echoes the point that was made by Alec Neal and his contribution, is that time is very limited. And one of the things that we have been pursuing with Gemini is the need to try and build more time into this in order to give us the opportunity to pursue some of the wider options about providing sustainable employment on this site and ensuring that it can still be used for heavy rail work going forward. And that's why Scottish Enterprise and Transport Scotland have been involved with the whole of the sector in Scotland, the rail industry in Scotland, and looking at how we can repurpose this site in order to give it a sustainable future for employment in the rail industry going forward. But that will take us some time to be able to achieve that. And a key part of looking at that is to see how the existing site can be reconfigured in order to make it attractive for other interested parties to come and base themselves on that particular site. So one of the things that's been highlighted is the issue of electrification. Could a line into this particular site be electrified? It's around, it's around uh, four kilometres uh, that will have to be uh, electrified. I've already given direction to Network Rail to look at undertaking that work. The scoping work has already started in that. If that is one of the key things we need to do in order to deliver a new rail hub at this particular uh, site. However, that will take time. That will take time to have that work carried out. But the feasibility work and the assessment work has already been undertaken by Network Rail. And I'll give way to Patrick Harvey. Uh, Patrick I Harvey. The, the, the Minister for giving us some more information about that. And, and I think we all understand that it can't be done with the snap of the fingers. It, it will take some time. But can the Minister tell us what will be the financial context of a decision that Network Rail may need to make, or will the Scottish Government be able to make that final decision? Would that have to come from Scottish Government budget, or would it come from network rail funds? Who decides and who pays once the, the feasibility work has been done? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, President Officer, in effect, uh, the Scottish Government would have to pay for that through its contribution to uh, network rail. Uh, the average cost is around a million pounds per kilometre. So the, the uh, electrification of that line into that particular route could cost us in the region of four million pounds. That's why it's also, before we undertake that work, it's critical we look at how we can reconfigure the site to see if we can get rail industry work undertaken there before we start just commissioning work if it turns out that we can't get rail work undertaken that particular site. I'll give way to the member again, but I'm very conscious of time, because I know. Oh, no, I'm content if members are content, and Cabinet Secretary, if you're content, let it run a little longer. Cab uh, Pat, can I just I, check I, the Cabinet Secretary about timings? Are you content that I, we're running a bit? I'll, I'll continue as best I can, President Officer. I know, because we have other engagements. Patrick Harvey. Grateful. Very briefly, uh, would this uh, cost not also reinforce the need for some way of recouping uh, the, the, the increase in the value of the site, either through a public ownership option or some other way of recouping that public investment rather than simply resulting in it being a, a, an increase in the value of a privately owned asset. Can so the, the, the site is owned by a private company at the present time, a, a leaseholder, uh, Hansteins, and it is also fair to say to them that they are presently undertaking work on how they can reconfigure the site uh, to make it more viable uh, for the rail industry going forward. So there's, a, there's an important element here about making sure that as we look at the options in redeveloping this site, our focus is on how we can do that to make it viable for the railway industry, for the future needs of our railway industry, and do it in a way that can create sustainable employment uh, for people on that particular uh, site. And that's central to the work that's been undertaken by Scottish Enterprise and also, and also by, uh, by, uh, by uh, Transport Scotland. I'll give way briefly to the member, but I do want to make progress because I'm very conscious of time and I've got other matters I have to deal with, President Officer. I, thank, I, th I thought that, and I think the, I think the Chamber will note that. Yeah. Briefly, but Mr Kelly. Thank you. Briefly, can you address the point I made about the ScotRail 170s contract? Oh, no, 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 no. Being allocated that point to the point. Can you wait till I call you, Cabinet 
just a moment, sit down, please. Could you just wait till I call you? I know you're desperate to answer, but not tune your feet at the one time. Please sit yeah, down now, Cabinet Secretary. I will address that point if the member lets me make progress on the, uh, on the issue. Now, Bob Doris raised the issue, if it's not Gemini in this site, then who is it going to be in this site? And it's been put to us that ScotRail should step in and take over the site, or that Network Rail should step in, step in and they should take over uh, the site. Both parties have considered this matter in detail at the request of the Scottish Government and also have engaged with the trade unions on this matter. Neither ScotRail require the site. They have existing capacity within their own engineering workshops as it stands at the present time, and Network Rail don't require it at the present time. However, there is a potential for them to be interested in being involved in some form of hub if it is progressed in being moved forward. And that's why the work that we're doing with the industry in order to understand their needs and the potential use of this site is so critical to finding a sustainable future for that. And that's why the, the hub idea it could involve public and private sector involvement in creating the type of environment that allows us to create that sustainable approach. And that's exactly what we are doing. However, it also meets the challenge that Alec Neil raised, and that is that will take us time to be able to do that. And that's why we're applying as much pressure as we can to Gemini and Matares and looking at other uh, rolling stock providers if there is any other work that can be put into that site in order to try and sustain it going forward. And that's what we'll continue to try and do. We're not going to give up on the site. We'll do everything we can, but time is limited in what we can actually do. Now, uh, James Keller raised the issue of the 170 class uh, trains uh, and the ScotRail element of those. Those trains are not owned by ScotRail. Those trains are actually owned by a leasing co company called Porterbrook, who own them as part of the leasing arrangement that ScotRail have for rolling stock and also for, I believe, another rolling stock provider, another, uh, it's a northern route uh, in a, a, a franchise in England. Uh, and this is a part of the challenge is that the very franchising nature of the industry means that the rolling stock is very often not actually owned by the service provider themselves. They're owned by private companies. And therefore, the decision on where that work should actually go to is a decision which is made by Porterbrook, not ScotRail, because they own the rolling stock in itself. So what we are doing is trying to make sure that as much of that type of work that can be undertaken in Scotland is undertaken in Scotland. I need to make progress, I'm afraid. And a key part of that is to also recognise, as was rightly pointed out, there are several other companies in Scotland that are involved in bidding for that type of work as well, that employ significant workforce within this sector. Uh, the member, I think, said something about franchising. Uh, we don't have any option on franchising. Legally, we have to franchise because of the Railways Act as it stands at the present moment. And that continues to be uh, the case. But look, that's for a debate for elsewhere, and it doesn't address the issue uh, in relation to Springburn. So, President Officer, in the limited time uh, that we've had, we've been working very, very closely with the unions and with all of the industry in Scotland to try and find a way in which to repurpose this site. And the hub is the most effective way, we believe, that we can go about achieving that and repurposing the site, given the design of it, also looking at electrification of the site, if that helps us to achieve that, and looking at how that can meet the needs of the industry in the years ahead. And what we will continue to do is to work with all to try and achieve that, while at the same time pressing Gemini and others in the industry to try and give us more time to allow us to develop that as we meet the demands that have been set by the timescale being set uh, by Gemini. But equally, as it stands at the present moment, the Scottish Government's agencies from Scottish Enterprise through to Transport Scotland and PACE are all doing what they can. PACE stand ready to offer support and advice to the workforce as and where necessary. But I can assure members we will continue to do everything we can within the limited abilities we have in this matter to try to make sure that that site continues to be used for heavy rail purposes to serve our industry here in Scotland in the years ahead. Thank you. Can I thank all the members for their contributions in this very important debate? That's why I've extended the time for it. And I thank the Cabinet Secretary for extending his time. That concludes the debate and I close this meeting of Parliament.